Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, host of the Football History Dude podcast, right here on the Sports History Network. Now, before we jump into another sports history adventure, let me tell you about this episode's sponsor. We partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States, where you can get deals on over 30,000 autograph sports collectibles. They even have film, music, and other entertainment autographs on the site, so there's something for everyone. Perhaps you're looking for a gift for Mother's Day, or maybe Father's Day. Heck, who needs a holiday as an excuse to give a piece of sports history to your loved ones? Or how about yourself? Today seems like a great day to add to your sports cave, right? But how is RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes, so there are no extra markups, and they choose to pass these savings on to the customer. All orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and money-back guarantee. And to make sure RSA knows that the Sports History Network sent you, we created a special link for you. All you have to do is head to shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. Again, that's shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. Head over there to get your piece of sports history today. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, sports fans, and welcome to another edition of Yesterday Sports on the Sports History Network. Today I am joined by Dave DiPaolo, a friend and fellow sports historian. And today we're going to discuss the 1971 fight of the century between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. Uh, for those who don't know the the, the whole history of it, um, so some people still considered Muhammad Ali to be the champion because he never actually lost his title in the ring. Uh, he won the title in 1964 from Sonny Liston. And then 1967, he received a draft notice from the United States Draft Board. He refused induction on the grounds that war was against his religious beliefs. Stripped of the title, banned from boxing in most states. And then they had a tournament, right, Dave? To decide who would be the new champion. And uh, I, if, if my recollection is correct... If my recollection is correct, Frazier didn't even take part in the tournament. He just waited. He had a very good manager. Uh, what was his name? Yancey uh, Durham. Yancey Durham was his manager. Yeah, Yank him Durham. Yeah. Yep. yeah, Yank Durham, his manager, said, the heck with this tournament. We'll just wait to see who wins, and then you'll win her. <laughs> If my recollection is correct, I, I think they, Mark. Yeah, yeah I, I think he actually won. Uh, when, when Fraser actually became the champion, he I think he was I think was it uh was it uh, Mathis that he defeated? Jimmy, um, uh, uh, and Jimmy then he Ellis. had the title. I guess. Oh, it was Ellis. I'm sorry, Jimmy Ellis. That's right. Jimmy. Yep. I think Jimmy Ellis won yep. the tournament. And there were some good fighters in the tournament. I I think, uh, I'm not positive, but I think Ellis uh, defeated Jerry Quarry. I think that was the final in the, in the tournament. I think those two were the final two contestants. And Jimmy Ellis beat yes. Jerry Quarry. And then Frazier fought Ellis, and uh, he, he took the title from Ellis. <laughs> Yeah, he knocked him out, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't remember. I, when, I think Frazier was, yeah, it was 27-0 and 0 when they met. 27-0 and 0 Frazier. I think Ali was 31-0, and 0, if I'm not mistaken. I didn't write it down, but I, I remember those wrecks sticking. You know, I think at the time, it was the first championship fight where the both guys were undefeated. Is that correct? That could be so. correct. Yeah. Could be correct. I, both I think Olympics, it was the first. Uh, I think it was the first time ever. I, I think you're right, and they were both uh, gold medalists um, in the Olympics. You're right. 
Frazier was in the Olympics in 64 right, when Bob Hayes from the Dallas Cowboys. Right. I think they were actually roommates. And uh, Frazier actually won the, he, yes, he won the Olympic title, Frazier, with a dislocated thumb. That's right. That was a big thing. I didn't really know about that until recently. Um, yeah. And then he went home, Mark. This is this is unbelievable. I was watching a show. I'm gonna. It's, it was called Tape Eighty Eight. Muhammad okay. Ali. If you type it into YouTube, it comes up. Tape Eighty Eight. There's some great background on both fighters. And this Joe Frazier was so poor when he came home. He was the Olympic champion. That there was a writer in the newspaper in the Philadelphia paper, and there was another gentleman who talked on this video. He says he did a radio show. Uh, it was right around Christmas, and the people felt so badly. Joe Frazier said he got money and gifts and toys from people all over the world for his kids for Christmas. He had no job. He he, he, wow. he, he, he you know, supposedly, yeah, it's unbelievable. His, I, I, his first fight where he actually won, uh, defended his title, I think he made $125 off the tickets that he personally sold himself. That was his purse. Oh, unbelievable. unbelievable if you think about it. <laughs> that is that is unbelievable. You know, because uh who would ever think? Think of the amount of money these guys get paid today to fight. And yet it yeah. was uh you know, the guy <laughs> talks about it was 1964, Christmas of 1964. The guy that had the radio show actually brings that up in, uh, in this uh tape that I just told you about, tape 88. And he talks about it, it was very very interesting. It was actually sad in a way. You know? Yeah. That, that's incredible. Crazy stuff. Yeah. But and, I remember uh, the Ali, fight, Mark. You probably remember. You probably, I remember the night of the fight. Oh, yeah. The hype. The Go hype ahead, leading up to the fight. <laughs> the hype leading up to the fight was incredible. Like nothing ever seen before. Everyone was talking about it, right? Well, yeah. it... it well, even people that right. weren't sports, fans. yeah, it was. I thought it was a. I, I, it was a in a lot of clothes. What do they call it? A cl circuit, a closed circuit television in the movie theaters. He had to go to right. the theaters. They weren't having it on the television set at that time. But, no, um, I thought it was one of the earlier ones for that. But I looked it up. The closed circuit, believe it or not, started in the late forties. I didn't realize wow. it went that far back. I never would have guessed that. Um, no, I was 1948, and um, I, you, I, it's it was it, I couldn't believe it went that far back. I thought this was one of the earlier ones. I remember playing here in Waterbury, Connecticut, at the Palace Theater, and I forgot how much it was to get in. Um, I want to say, yeah, I can't remember, Mark, what that was. Well, it was expensive. I know that. Yes. Uh, what ended up happening was, uh, I, not, I don't know if you knew this, the fight promoter that promoted the Ali Fraser fight won. He never, uh, he never did a fight before. This was his first promotion, and he 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 actually got Jack Kent Cook, who owned the Washington Redskins, and I think at the time the mm -hmm. Los Angeles Lakers. He got him to put four point to five million dollars to put in to pro help promote this fight. Ken Cook was going to make, I think, uh, he was going to make a, a million and a half off of it. And um, right. I just saw that. I just yes, I just jotted down. It was nineteen forty eight, the first closed circuit television fight. The Joe Lewis versus Jersey Joe Walker. I didn't know that until I, I heard about this last night. How about that? <laughs> I never would have guessed that. I never would have guessed that. No, but this was uh, this fight, particular fight that we're going to talk about was carried in. I know it was carried in fifty countries. They said, and at the time, it was a record three hundred million around the world watched it. That was a that was a record back then. Yeah. And all the celebrities were there, right? Oh, All the Mark. celebrities went to the every, free. every mark. Everybody, <laughs> every every celebrity. They said every that the celebrity men, there they, was. They said that the men Frank were Sinatra just the dancers and the women. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>
And Frank Sinatra was a photographer. Listen, Frank Sinatra, Time magazine. he couldn't get a ticket, so he was a ringside photographer for uh, Life magazine, they said. That's right. And Burt Lancaster was one of the announcers. Burt Lancaster. <laughs> because he knew the promoter, the Mark. I didn't know. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. He, yep. The. The, the, the promoter's name was Jerry Parencio. And I guess Lancaster was his friend. You're right. And um, mm. there's another clip if people ever want to watch uh, the back, like the kind of surrounding the, the, say, the social climate. It captures it very well. It's called One Nation Divisible. That's the name of the thing on YouTube. And it's right. broken down. You can watch the whole thing. If you want to watch the whole thing, it's good. But if you, it's also broken down into four parts. And the video on the broken down is better. If you watch it, part one, part two, yeah. part three, part four, the video is much clearer. And it right. explains how the social climate was. They said that Ali was the uh, you know, black man's champion and Joe Frazier was the white man's champion. And you know the people said, oh, Ali was a draft dodger. He didn't go to the war. We're not going to – it was very, very – there was a lot of crazy controversy around this whole. It became right. very political. Put it to you that way. Yes, it, did. it seemed like no matter where, it seemed like controversy just followed Ali. No matter where he went or what he did, who he fought, there was always controversy. And Frazier really just Frazier didn't care about any of it. He just wanted to get in the ring and get down to business. So. uh how, how no, old were you? Exactly um, right. How old were you uh, when this fight took place? Today? I was. Let's see. Seven, I was. I was. Uh, you know, I was ten or eleven, Mark. I. I don't know if I was turning eleven in November, but the fight was in March. I think I was ten, going on eleven. Oh. And right. uh, I forgot what grade I was in. I had a transistor radio. And I kept it under oh, my yeah. pillow. And I listened. To, uh, there was a radio station, AM. And they uh, they gave round by round updates of the fight. Is, it was very <laughs> exciting. It was very exciting for a ten year old. I was three weeks shy of my ninth birthday. Uh, me and my brother. My brother was twelve, and we were both rooting for Frazier. And the same exact thing that you were talking about, Dave. The transistor radio. That there was a news station. I think it was on AM, AM radio. There was a news station, and after every round, they would give you an update on the fight, right? And the that's right. That was uh, yeah. The transistor radio was a big thing back then. It was phenomenal, actually. We were we were in our bedroom. Me and my Ringside. brother were were in our bedroom. Yes. What's that? Yeah. And our yeah, parents the ringside, stay up late. the ringside seats were. Oh, they did. Oh yeah, yep. they would let yep. us stay up late uh, and, for uh, Monday night football and and uh, you know any special sporting event like this. They would let us stay up under one condition, though. When the when the alarm went off to get up for school, you better be up. And we we did. We got up right there you away go. because we knew if we didn't, that would be the end of the. They wouldn't let us stay up late if we didn't get there you up. Go. <laughs> so yeah, they, that news station would give updates after each round. And I, I just wanted to backtrack Oops, a little. It was quite exciting. Oh, oh it was amazing. I just wanted to backtrack a little, you know, leading up to the fight, how uh, Ali would Ali would always uh, mock his opponents before the fight, try to get them, try to get them angry, you know, because most most of the fighters that he fought, they would lose their focus, you know. He he would get them angry, and uh, most fighters didn't fight well, on. Uh, when when Ali would get them angry, but it was very different with Frazier. Um, he he uh, made a mistake with with Frazier because the angrier Frazier got, the better he fought. 
And like you were talking about before, there was yeah. a lot of uh, racial issues going on. And he even he went so far as to call Frazier an Uncle Tom. And that was that yes. was really hurtful to that was very hurtful to Frazier because Frazier grew up <laughs> in South Carolina, and he was the youngest of twelve children. So he knew yes. the sting right. of racism. No one knew the sting of racism better were, than Frazier. So that really bothered him. No, that Frazier, and and uh, he he was uh, instrumental in helping Ali to get to get his boxing license back, and he even lent money. He exactly, was lending money to yes. Ali. So yes. this uh, that's right. You know this this really uh, hurt Frazier. Deeply, <laughs> he vowed revenge. He said there's, he was going to get there, revenge. There's some footage of Joe Fraser talking, and he's saying how he didn't. Under, he was very upset. He was frustrated about it. He didn't understand why yeah. the guy was doing it. He's saying, "Why is this guy doing this?" When I helped him out, like you said, Mark, you said it with the money, and he helped them do some other things. Whatever they needed him to do, he said he would do it for him. So they could get right. them back because they wanted to fight, and uh, there was a there was a story that Ali actually came into Philadelphia, and he was going to set up training there. And Fraser got mad about it because that's his that's his territory. Or he called that this is my crib. Joe Fraser said, and right. uh, Ali came into town, and there was a a lot of people. He they met up, and Ali said, "We'll go over to the park." And we'll fight right now. Joe Frazier, he thought it was a, a publicity stunt, so he never showed up. Ali went over right. to the park. Thousands of people were there. Frazier never showed up. And he, they said, oh, they wrote a newspaper article. He didn't show up and this and this. And so that bothered him even more. You know, he's saying, I did, yeah. you know, it was crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, those were the kind of things I got a, that I got a, did. I got a price here, Mark. No, he did. He was, he was. I look. He was a great promoter of fights. If you think about it, uh, he he did like his own. But Fraser, Fraser's, Fraser's uh, take on it all was, hey, look, we're guaranteed two point five million each, which was astronomical back then for a fight. And oh, he said, yeah. why do we need to promote anything? We're getting paid. We're getting paid anyway. He said. <laughs> right, it was already signed. <laughs> it was already sold out. Like you, said, Frank Sinatra he, couldn't he, even get a ticket. He did, yes. So, well, I don't know if you want to. Uh, I think we did. Uh, you know, pretty much uh, leading uh, up to the fight. So uh, we did. Yeah, I, I, I will say this, Mark. Um, right. They, I know they made. I know they made. Uh, they, the gate produced one and a half million dollars, meaning the people that came into Madison Square Garden. And they said, but you know something, there was the pay per view made forty five million because twenty five million people went to the theaters to watch this fight, and that was wow. I think the tickets were twenty or twenty five bucks to get into the theater, if I remember correctly. So yeah, there was a lot of money generated uh, yeah. for this fight. Back then, $25 was a lot. You know? Yeah. No, it was. Uh, the the gate produced the $1.5 million that it produced, the gate. They said that would be over $10 million today. Yeah. $10 well, million. The money was The money, money was unheard of. Nobody, you know, no fight was producing that kind of money. Well, before we get to the fight, is there anything uh, else you, you wanted to say le about leading up to the fight? Well, yeah. Be prior to the fight, Mark, uh, Archie Moore went into the dressing rooms. You know, Archie Moore, the, the, the <laughs> former heavyweight, he went into the dressing right. rooms to do to do um, to do um, interviews and. Um, right. I didn't see it on the first. I watched one video, the One Nation Indivisible. It shows Joe Frazier. But the other 
uh, video that I'm talking about called Tape 88, Muhammad Ali. He, he Joe Frazier's yeah. mad. He's, he's, he's in the dressing room, and he's saying, you guys didn't even tell me you were coming in here. He goes, you just showed up. I right. all of a sudden there's cameras in here. He goes, but nobody asked me about it. He was actually upset about it, and you can see all that on that other video. It's, it's actually right. phenomenal. It really is to see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll have to check. I'll have to check that out. It's it's, so, it's you know if you just watched yeah if you just watched the other show, Mark, you would think oh well Joe Frazier right. is going along with it and he's talking, but then you see really it really caught him off guard and he kind of didn't like it because as you said earlier he was all business. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah, yep. He was totally business. He just wanted to get in the ring and let's get it on. But um, as the as the fight start, uh, Frazier was notoriously he was a notoriously slow starter. He usually it usually took him a few rounds That's to right. get going. So when they you know me and my brother are listening on the radio, and they're giving a little update on each round, and it didn't sound good in the early rounds. It didn't sound good for Frazier. Sounded like, you know, Ali was getting the best of him, which he was, because like I said, Frazier was not, he was not, um, it took him a few rounds to really get going. He, it was n notorious for that. And he, uh, Ali was using that reach, you know, he had a big reach advantage. So he was using that reach advantage to keep Frazier from getting inside. And he was piling up a lot of points. With, you know, he was, you know how he how he did it. He would use that reach, and uh, he would use his jab, use jabbing, 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 and he'd pile up a lot of points. The judges, but then, uh, you know, Frazier's style was just to keep moving forward. He was like a bull. He just kept moving forward. He was relentless, and. He'd wear down his opponents with the with the uh, body shots. He would just keep keep working the body, working the body, and eventually, that you know, <laughs> after a while, it's hard to to keep your arms up to block to block the punches when you're getting all those body shots. It eventually wears you down, and then that's when he sets them up for the left hook. So in the middle rounds, Frazier yep. started ducking the punches and wearing down Ali with the body shots. So you know, Ali would That's Ali right. was Ali was a very skilled skilled boxer. Uh, he, you know, he would dance and he would move and he'd flick the jab in your face, and it was it was hard to hit him because he was always he was always moving backwards. Right, that was his style. He was, he, uh, was hard to hit. Him. That, yeah, he was. Uh, he was very. He, I tell you, he could really take a punch, Muhammad Ali. I was, I, I oh. like you. I was rooting for Joe Frazier, but uh, I, 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 I rewatched the fight and I tried to. I, I kind of graded it the other night. I looked at it myself, and out of the first five rounds, Mark, getting back to the slow start. Right. I only had Fraser winning one round out of the first out of the first um five. Um uh -huh. Ali, I had a couple of rounds even, believe it or not. They looked very close, but Ali was he won the first two handily. And like and then he was Ali. fighting flat footed Ali, Ali, meaning he was really loading up on his it looked like he wanted to finish Fraser off early. It really did. Right. And he was you summed it up. He was really getting a lot of a lot of shots in there, peppering them, but nothing, no big blows. He's just piling up the points. But right. Joe Frazier was hitting hitting him with body shots, like you said. And I don't know when they – I never, I don't know how they score a professional fight, but I don't know if the body shots count as much as the other, you know, the head shots. But Frazier was you, – you could hear him grunting, and he was really yeah. hitting him with uh, midsection and the ribs. A lot, and it was right. by by the mid rounds. I say round six through ten. I'm looking at it here. I had Joe Frazier 
winning three of those rounds, six, seven, and eight, I had Frazier. Ali came on in the ninth round. That was his biggest round of the whole thing. And he actually made Joe Frazier take a step backwards or two. He actually right. he actually stunned him. But right. Couldn't, but couldn't finish him off. Right. Couldn't finish him off. That was round nine. That was a big round for Ali, the biggest round of the fight for him, actually. Yeah. Then, Go ahead, uh, Mark. Then, uh, what about, I don't, I don't know about the 10th round, but I know the 11th round. Uh, I guess the 10th round was probably pretty much even. I don't know. How did you score that round? Yeah. Uh, round 10. Pretty much even. I, I gave it. I get. I gave it a little to Ali because he. It was almost after that ninth round. He came out almost like he knew he was in trouble. Fra- right. Frazier came back in the late in the later part of the tenth round, but I don't think he made up enough ground. I did give it to Ali. I know what you're going to say about round eleven. That was Frazier's big. That up to that point, his biggest round, round eleven, was big. He stunned him. I thought Ali was going to go. His knees buckled. Yes, that was a huge round for for Frazier. That was a huge round. Yeah, when they came out for that round, they both looked like they were kind of getting tired. And uh, I think Frazier knew he was slightly behind in the fight, and so he he went on the attack. And I think there was there was about thirty seconds um, left in the eleventh round. It was about thirty seconds left in the eleventh round. And Frazier caught Ali with a with a left hook, and like you said, his knees his knees buckled. Then he hit him with two more left hooks. And uh, yeah, like you said, it looked like Ali might go down, but he he survived the round. To his credit, like you said, he could <laughs> he could take um... a punch. That's for sure. There was uh so. yeah, there was this there was a, a moment in there, Mark, where Ali's going backwards and he drops his gloves like down by his waist, by his knee, and they interviewed right. Joe Fraser about it, and he says he was I, I thought he was playing possum, you know, because a guy is dangerous when he is hurt. So I moved in on right. him cautiously, and like you said, because it was near the end of the round, he had lost time on yeah. that Fraser. Right, and, but he right. won that. He won that round big. Yeah, um, I think they. I think that, they that, asked that was him, eleven. You know, I, I had. Fr- Go ahead, Mark. I think uh, there was an interview, like you said. Uh, there was an interview I saw where they asked Frazier, you know, how come you didn't go in for the kill? And like you said, he said uh, because I wasn't sure. You know, Ali was always fooling around and. You didn't know. You never really knew if he was truly hurt or if he was just playing possum. So he said, "You know, that's why I was a little cautious there." But then we go to the so we go to the twelfth round. I thought uh, I thought the twelfth, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen was pretty much. Uh, Back and forth. I think they were pretty much even. I don't know how you scored it. Round 12. How did you score round 12? Um, um, the, last, the last five rounds, Mark, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, I had Fraser taking... Five, four of those five rounds. I gave Ali the 14th because he, in the 14th round, he came out, he looked like pretty, it's almost as if he got rejuvenated somehow. But I had Frazier taken four out of those last five rounds. Okay. Um, I don't so. know if you remember, Don Don Dumphy, who was announcing the fight on the, uh, you know, over the live circuit. Don Dumphy right. said during the fight, if you watched it, he said, I've never seen Muhammad Ali take such a beating. That's what he said. Yeah. The only the only fighter 
who had knocked Ali down. Prior to this was Henry Cooper. Henry Cooper uh, was in England. Eng he was from England. He was the only guy yes. that knocked Ali down. But then, uh, of course, Ali got back up and uh, he finished. Uh, I think. Uh, I think he finished off Cooper with a TKO. I think he got cut. Uh -huh. Henry Cooper got cut, and uh, Ali won the fight. But uh, yeah, uh, me and my brother, like I said, me and my brother are listening to this, and my brother was biting his nails, and I was pacing back and forth on the bedroom floor, and it was so close, you know. After after the fourteenth round, it could have really gone either way. I think uh, it was it was a very close fight. And we were really, you know, me and my brother were just pacing back and forth. My brother was biting his nails. And then, of course, came the 15th round. And you know what happened in the 15th round? You want to yes. pick it up there? Uh, it was uh... in the 15th round. I don't remember. At a, I don't remember exactly at what point. The knock that the knockdown happened. I guess it was yeah, probably that, about it, it, um that I I don't know if it was a minute into it, uh, Mark. About maybe even a little could have been a little. It could have been about a minute into the round. Um, yeah, he, he he hits him with a left Fraser, and then he, it's almost like he hits him. Then he stops for a second, and then he comes back. The timing was perfect. It came out of nowhere. Fraser later on, he said, "You know, I was gassed. I had nothing left." He goes, but that punch came out of right. nowhere. And then when they, Ali was watching, have you ever seen the program uh, that's narrated by Marv Albert? Have you ever watched that, Mark? Yes, yes. Where he's got, uh, Marv Albert is in the studio and he has Joe Fraser live with him and Muhammad Ali is right. watching it at his house. And yeah, I remember he that. He tells Mar Joe Fraser tells Marnat. He, he tells Marv Albert in the beginning of the um of the show, this is only the second time I've ever watched it. Marv Albert can't believe it. Marv Albert's taken back by yeah. him. He says, You've never seen it? He goes, Well, maybe one time. He goes, but he goes, This is the first time I've seen it in, you know, like 10 years. And Muhammad Ali started was starting to get a little uh, he was very slow at that point. He was still able to speak fairly well, but he was very, his speech was very slow. And he says, when I got yeah. knocked down, I was just, he says, you know, you're down and you just in your head, you're saying, get up, get up. He was only down yeah. for four <laughs> seconds. He goes, but right. you know, it, it, you, you realize that you're down and you just get up and it happens so fast that, you know, but, um, I looked at the judges' scorecards, Mark. Uh, I looked it up last night, and there was there was three. Uh, Arthur McCanty, the referee, had eight rounds to Fraser, six for Ali with one even, and the two judges uh -huh. had nine and six Fraser, and one guy one guy had an eleven and four Fraser. Uh, I even though what? I was rooting for Fraser, I looked at it up objectively the other night, and I had an eight, five, and two. I thought Fraser won eight eight rounds, five for Ali, and I thought two were very even. And that was, like I said, I don't professionally grade fights, but, you know, Fraser, mm. Fraser landed an awful lot of body shots. He really did. Oh, yeah. And that's what set him up in the later rounds because, uh, you know, you can only take so many of those body shots, and then it's hard to keep your arms up to block the punches. Those body shots really take take that's so right. much out of you, and that's what he would do. He would just keep hitting you with those body shots, and he'd set you up for that left hook. So then, the, it seemed like uh, once the fight was over, it seemed like it took forever to to finally get the the decision. You know, we're listening on the radio, and we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And it seemed like it took forever. Finally, 
the guy came on the radio and said, unanimous decision, Frazier, Frazier won the fight. And we, me and my brother were jumping for, jumping for joy. We were jumping around the bedroom. Right. <laughs> and you, you were doing the same thing, right? You had you to change this to radio. I did. There was there was nobody in there with me to celebrate it, but I I was you know you, I was very you know for a young guy you're like oh good he, you know he won the fight and 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 you, you look, going back to some of those rounds there was a couple there was a round there and I'm sure you've seen it where Ali started to lay back on the ropes. This was before we knew about rope and dope. We didn't really know about it then. That came out in the Foreman fight, but he was laying yep. back on the ropes. And there's a point where Fraser actually grabs him by his forearms and pulls him into the back into the ring. In other words, enough of this garbage. Other people were booing. If you're, if you, if you watch yeah. tape eighty eight, I'm telling you, Mark, you'll love it. Go watch tape eighty eight. That's what it's called. Tape eighty eight, Muhammad Ali. You can actually hear the people because there's no announcing, so it's almost as if you're sitting in ringside watching it. And there's more camera angles in that tape than there is of of, of, of any. Uh, broadcast of the fight that I've ever seen, and you could you yeah. could actually see Ali talking to him in his ear. He would, they were talking to each other the right. whole fight. And at one point, Arthur McCanty, the referee, says, "Stop talking." He actually comes out and yeah. says that. Yeah, yeah, he was a good referee, and it's amazing. Fifty-two years later, fifty-two years later. People are still making documentaries about this fight and writing books about this fight. And people still want to talk about it, like we're talking about it right now. And that's why they call it the fight of the century. It's 52 years ago already. It's hard to believe. Yeah. Now, the next, the next morning. Uh, the anniversary. The next morning. March 7th, right? Yes. March 7th. Be 52 years. Then the next morning. Yeah, Mo, I'm sorry. Couldn't wait. Yep. What is, What was it, Dave? What did you say, Dave? I think Dave? it was March 8th of uh, the fight, Mark. Was I think it March, it was March 8th? 8th, the fight. Okay. March 8th. I think it I was, yeah. Seven. Okay, you're probably right. I got to look at it. Well, it was either it was either the seventh or the eighth. You could be right. I know that. But now I the know this, Mark. I, I know it was a Monday. I, I, I know it was, it was a, a Monday, Monday night. Oh, I don't it remember. It was a Monday that. night. It was the yeah. It was a Monday night, and they they when they planned for this fight, they said it was the mm -hmm. only night open in March for Madison Square Garden. What they were saying was. They were saying that Muhammad Ali was going to go to court again for this decision about the war. And they said if it doesn't go in his favor, he was actually going to actually thought he was maybe going to do jail time. So they wanted to get the fight in before that. That's why they made it in March. March 8th, I think it was, was the only night open. And there was a, but it really wasn't open. There was a James Taylor concert at Madison Square Garden. They told him, that's it. You can't do the concert. We're going to have the fight that night. And Taylor ended up Taylor ended up getting 30 tickets for free. Wow. That's a pretty good that? deal. Yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> now yeah. Tuesday morning, so Tuesday morning comes. It's one of the few mornings I can recall yep. that I actually looked forward, looked forward to going to school. Actually, was looking forward to going to school <laughs> on Tuesday morning <laughs> so that you could talk about the fight with all your friends. <laughs> right? <laughs> Couldn't wait exactly. to talk to all my friends mm. about the fight. And the, and the newspaper, of course, was a big thing back then. You know, we didn't have we didn't have internet or anything. So, if you wanted to read about the fight, you had to you had to get the newspaper in the morning, right? And then they had all the, the pictures in the newspaper and all the articles about the fight. 
And mm-hmm. that's the only way. That's the that's only right. way we got our information, right? That's the only way we got our information back then. You had to get the newspaper. I think you're right, though. I think it was March eighth. It was one of the. I Mark, think you're it was right one about... of the greatest heavyweight fights of all time. Yeah, it, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I thought it was the eighth, but was, people say it could have been the greatest of all. T- the pace for the heavyweight, you know, guys today, some of these guys are brutal. You watch these fights today, these, these heavyweight fights, are, some of them are absolutely terrible. This was a yeah. very fast-paced fight, and people today still think it's the the man uh, who did some of the narration in one of those videos I watched. He said it, people didn't want to leave the arena. They were around for 45 to 50 minutes. The cops were trying to clear the arena. People wouldn't go. They said they couldn't believe it. They said this was unbelievable. They were all standing around talking about it. And right. they said that Muhammad Ali was in the dressing room. And one of the guys went inside. I forgot who it was. And he said, and there was this woman in the dressing room. And she was at the foot of the table. Muhammad Ali was sitting on the training table, and she had her arms uh, uh, wrapped around his ankles, and it was Diana Ross. She was in the dressing room after the fight with Muhammad Ali. I forgot who was talking about it. But uh, they said that Joe Frazier, they said that, now Joe Frazier came out for the post-fight interview, and Muhammad Ali did not come out for it. Muhammad Ali actually ended up going to the hospital. He thought he had a broken jaw. Fraser comes out for the post-fight yeah. interview, and he says, I want him to apologize for all those things he said about me. That's what he says. There's a clip of him saying that. Yeah. I want him to apologize for all those things he said about me. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. He finally did apologize many years later. Many, many years later, he, he did yes. finally apologize. So... But like you said, that I mean, was, uh, uh, here, here's the here's the fight, Mark. It's it's unbelievable because uh, you 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 just uh, you just gotten done with this fifteen round fight, and that's what's on your mind. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And they both wound up in the hospital. So you wanted to add a few things, Dave? I did. I just wanted to talk about a couple of very interesting things about how after the fight, Muhammad Ali was still trying to say that he possibly could have won the fight. He was saying, look how good I look. You know, I, I just have a little swelling in the jaw, but look at Joe Frazier. You know, he got beat up. He looked terrible, Frazier. And one thing we didn't talk about earlier was Joe Frazier was uh, legally blind in one eye. 60 That's to right. 70% of his vision was lost in his left eye. And people didn't know that. A lot of people didn't know that at the time. And that actually affected him in the Thrill of Manila fight because his right eye was almost completely closed. So we couldn't right. see it all. And, yeah. and uh, Muhammad Ali was talking. But... A week after the fight, on the 16th or 15th of March, um, Joe Frazier ended up in the hospital. And they said, well, it wasn't related to the fight, but he had very, very terrible blood pressure. And there was a group of people who promote, helped promote Joe Frazier. They were behind him financially, a whole big, large group of people. And one of the guys that went... To, his name was Joe Hand. It was called Cloverlay. That was the that was the group of people that were behind Joe F- Frazier financially. He went to see him at the hospital, and he said it was very sad. He said Joe Frazier was in there, and he was all alone. There was nobody there. He said, and he was very he was very close to dying. This guy says, and right. one of yeah. Muhammad Ali, his business his business manager, Muhammad Ali's his name was Gene Kilroy. He said the word got back to him, and he called another. He called another uh, part of the Muhammad Ali entourage there, got people that were managing him, and he said, "Hey, Joe Frazier passed away." The word was out that Joe Frazier had died, 
And Muhammad right. Ali said, if he did, I'll never fight a, I'll never fight again, he said. Yeah. Yep. But from what I've from what Terrible. I understand, Joe Frazier had a history of of high blood pressure. He had high blush, blood pressure yes. going in, going into that fight. And you know, yes. uh, uh, Ali's manager, Angelo Dundee, mentioned something that was interesting because she mentioned that uh, Frazier, his face was very uh, swollen after the fight. And yes. Angelo Dundee said it had something to do with, uh, he claims it had something to do with the way they, they, uh, they breathed differently. He said Ali would breathe through his mouth. Now, I don't know if the, any of this is, you know, scientifically proven. I'm just going by what <laughs> Angelo Dundee said. He said Ali right. would breathe through his, you know, he would breathe through his mouth. And somehow that would help, that would help to uh, not cause him to get his, his face would not get as swollen. And and Frazier would breathe through his nose. He didn't breathe through his mouth. He breathed through his nose. So I guess that's the way he was taught. And that somehow caused uh, the more the more swelling. I don't know, you know, how if any of that can be proven. But this is what Angelo Dundee said. And you were mentioning the the you know well, the ice. He the, he had a he had to. Uh, he had to play some trickery, even to get his boxing license. When he first started boxing, you know how they tell you, cover your one eye, read the chart, cover your one eye. So he did that. Uh, and then they told him, now cover your other eye. And that was the eye that he could hardly see out of, like you were saying. So instead of covering oh. his eye, he just switched, he switched arms. And fooled he, he he said it was enough to fool the <laughs> the person. <laughs> so he was actually still using the same. He he just switched arms, and it was enough to yes. fool the person. Yep. Otherwise, he might not have even gotten a boxing license. <laughs> but they, you know, these are like you say. These That's are pretty like good. Things. I never heard that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. These are things you know. I, I, know I never heard that one, Mark. Yep. <laughs> oh, those were those were things you no know, one uh, I, aware of at the time. I I, but they were both, I looked at after that fight, Mark. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. Oh, I don't know what I was gonna. I was just gonna say, they both gave everything they had in that fight. No, you know, they both, uh, they, there was nothing left. You know, they both had to go to the hospital. And, well, you know, then you had the... No, you're the, right. Uh, the other fight, the, the thriller in Manila, where Ali said, that's the closest I ever felt to dying. He said, I felt like, felt like death, you know, <clears throat> I was at death's door. I'm sure that's. Uh, uh, there, was a, there was a gentleman. I, I can't think of who the fellow was, Mark. But there was a, a gentleman. Uh, I'll find the video. I'll send it to you. There's a gentleman that was in the that was in the arena that night at the freight at the Thrill of Manila fight in '75. Right. And <clears throat> he said that he he was near Ali's corner. And Ali told him to cut the gloves off. Ali was right. packing it in. I forgot what it was. It was either the twelfth round or the I can't remember. And right. um, what's his name? Wouldn't let him. Wouldn't let him do it. What's his name? That's his trainer. Angelo. And yeah. The funny Angelo thing is, Dundee. yes. If, if they had, and the opposite happened for Fraser. Fraser's right. manager knew that he probably couldn't see too good. It was Eddie Fuchs at the time, yeah, uh, because because Yank Durham had passed away, and so yeah. he said, you know, but Fraser wanted to continue into the fifteenth round, and Eddie Fuchs stopped the fight. But it's it's amazing that, you know, 
this a guy was saying, hey, I heard him say, cut the gloves off. He wasn't going to continue, Ali. I think it was the 11th or 12th round. But, I mean, it was uh, – that, 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 that was – that look, that was another tremendous fight. After the Frazier fight, what I was going to say before was after the first one, Frazier only fought – he fought 10 more times. Um, right. And I wasn't aware of this. He retired in 19 – he retired in 1976, but for some crazy reason, five years later, he attempted a comeback. I didn't know that. He fought yeah. this one guy. He he ended up, yeah, he ended up beating him, but he lost to Foreman twice, and he lost to Muhammad Ali twice after that. Right. The, sec, the second I fight, so. I'm going to be honest with you, the, the second Ali Frazier, yeah, the second Ali Frazier fight I forgot how many times Ali was warned about holding him behind the head. That fight was kind of, compared to the other two fights, that was a lackluster fight compared to the other two. The other two were it classics. Was. Two of the greatest yeah. of all time. Yeah, the second one was kind of lackluster, and it didn't have you know? the buildup either. Because the second fight, neither one of them uh, were, neither one of them were uh, championship. Uh, so that one was a 12-rounder. It was a non-title fight. It didn't have the build up and uh no, was, exactly right. Kind of, yeah, it was kind of black look. And that guy that he came back to fight nineteen eighty one, I think that uh, was actually a draw. He didn't even win that fight. Uh, it was a draw. Yeah, it was and, maybe it was a draw, that's right. And uh his son actually told you know that, that guy, this guy, that guy was, little... I don't even think this guy was ranked. The guy he fought, I don't even think was ranked in the top ten. And his son told him, "You know, Dad, I think, <laughs> I think it's time to pack it in, don't you?" <laughs> and he said, yeah, I guess, it, I guess it is. Yeah. I mean, I, Muhammad Ali went on to fight after this first fight, Mark, and, and even after the Fraser fight in '75, Muhammad Ali went on to fight, and I didn't know this. Remember he fought the wrestler Antonio Inoki? Remember that? Yes. Yep. Well, he ended up two weeks in the hospital after that, Muhammad Ali. He was getting kicked in the legs. And he had yeah. two infections in his legs. And he ended up in the hospital. Right. And then in 76, he fought, he fought Ken Norton at Yankee Stadium. Okay. And what they claim was he was Muhammad Ali was being managed by a lot of underhanded people, people right. that didn't have his best interests in mind. They wanted to keep him fighting, even though he showed signs. He showed signs of 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 not being well prior to right. him, much earlier than his his last fights. I mean, he he. What was his last fight? I think was Trevor Burbick. You know, that's right. We fought in the fought in the Bahamas or something. Yeah, and uh, the, the the fight was a disaster. They said it was delayed for three hours. They didn't have the proper boxing gloves. There was no bell. If you watch the if you watch the Trevor Burbick fight, they're actually making using like a horn to use the instead of a bell. It was very very bizarre the whole thing. But I mean. He, he was on thyroid medication, Muhammad Ali. There was a lot of things going on. Um, and they're saying he showed signs of Parkinson's as early as 1978. And, and right. I, what was that last fight? Was that 81, I think, or 82 or something? Yeah, probably around 81. Probably around 81. That was after he fought. I mean, the that guy was started after... in what, 1960? Yeah, well, that's when he won the gold medal in the Olympics. And the Burbick fight was after he had lost to Larry Holmes. He took a beating in the Larry Holmes fight. Thank you. It was terrible. Yeah. And then they then they had yep. him fighting uh, Trevor Burp. Yeah, like you said, he was managed by a lot of underhanded people. And uh, the doctor, uh, Ferdy Pacheco, the... Ali's uh, doctor kept telling him, you got to retire, you got to retire. And uh, he, he, he those wouldn't people, listen. Those people, well, yeah, like you said, it was he was under the control of those people, those underhanded people. So it was a sad Se ending. September, Mark, September of 19, 
September of 1977, Mark, he fought Ernie Savers, okay? He was a very hard puncher. You know that. Yeah, I remember watching that. He took 260... Yeah, he took 266 punches, Ali. Savers yep. landed 266 punches. I remember watching it. He Imagine took that. A beating in that. He won the fight, but he took a beating. Took a tremendous Terrible. beating in that. Yeah. That yeah, was not the a good ending. Sort of, I wasn't, you know, I, I gained more res No, I gained more respect for him years later after realizing, right. look, the guy really, he was... He was able to take on a lot of different fighters, and 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 you know, look at all the different fighters he fought. He, even George Foreman, he beat George Foreman. I mean, they all had very different styles. Boxing is a, you know, uh, is a, the fights are made of matchups or what makes the, you know, different right. styles. And Frazier could never beat George Foreman. He'd never be able to beat him. He just right. didn't match up good against him. But no, Ali was able style. to adapt, and he was able to. Yes, he was able to beat these big heavy punchers like like Ron Lyle and Foreman and 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 uh, you know uh, Savers and he he, he was yeah. able to do, you know he was able to do all that. And I give him a lot of credit for that. Yeah, he outsmarted those guys. He you outsmarted know? all those all those bigger guys. Yeah, you know. And and you know one other thing, Mark. Before we go, who knows where all the money went? If you think about it, because. He made five and a half million for the Foreman fight, and he made nine million for the Holmes fight. These were towards the end of his career, and who knows how much he made before all that. And so, I mean, yeah. nobody really knew. They said, you know, they don't know, you know, if he had money or he or he didn't have money. Yeah. But you know, he was making a ton of money. That was that was the point. Yeah, but um, he tried. He was too trusting. He trusted all these people. He was very uh, too trusting, they say, uh, and he trusted all these people, and these people weren't, you know, out for his best interest. They were just out for what they could get. So, like you said, there was just a lot of underhanded. He was surrounded by a lot of underhanded people, and uh, he put too much trust in these people, and they took they took advantage of him. It was sad, very sad. So, well, that fight we took, that fight we just talked about though was still one of the greatest of all time, Mark. I don't care what anybody oh, says. Yeah, they're still talking about it. Fifty-two years later, they're still talking about it. Uh, I should I, I, I should have. Some, some of my yeah. friends are younger than me. Yeah, my, a couple of my friends that are younger than me. You know, I they we watch some of this stuff on. When they come over to watch football on Sundays, I throw other stuff in there, like the fights and stuff. And they don't. Understand. I still right. say to this day that seventy-one fight, the one in the Madison Square Garden, the one we just discussed, was probably yeah. uh, the biggest sporting event in my lifetime. I think, really, the the, the way it came off. Uh, I'm not saying that there are more people watch Super Bowls and all that stuff. They promote all. This was a this was a week night. Okay, a weeknight sporting event. To, to, I'll still say it to this day. Probably the biggest sporting event in my lifetime as far as being, like, it was a spectacle. And yet they didn't have yeah. all the avenues to promote that like they do today. It's, it's not even close. Right. Yet it just, it, it was it was tremendous. People don't understand unless they were around back then. You couldn't explain it to somebody. No, it was an event. It was a huge event. It wasn't just a... Uh... It wasn't just a, a fight. It was a, a, an event. Like, everybody talked about it. Before the fight, everyone wanted to talk about it. And after the fight, everyone wanted to talk about it. And 52 years later, we're still talking about it. So. There you go. I, I wanted to add, I wanted right. to add, uh, before we wrap it up, I wanted to add, uh, I, I, I would like to dedicate this uh, podcast to uh, Frank Redding. He, he was one of our uh, podcasters, and uh, a couple years ago, maybe it wasn't even that long ago, uh, Frank Redden uh, suddenly passed away, and uh, he, had a, he had a podcast called Terrible. Ringside with Redding, Ringside with Redding, and uh, he would talk about boxing, and he would talk about pro wrestling. 
and uh, his his uh, podcast is still up there. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't get to do that many shows, and he was very enthusiastic about it. But unfortunately, uh, we lost Frank a couple years ago. So, well, uh, I wanted to dedicate this to Frank. Okay, I think uh, that's nice, yeah, Mark. Yeah, he was a good guy, very good guy. Beautiful. Okay. All right, Dave. I think we're going to wrap it up. Very good. All right, Mark. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned... We're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website, seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at Sports. HistoryNetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to SportsHistoryNetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.